So joining us today, I've got Arlen Nipper. Uh, he's the president and CTO of SiriusLink. He's also the co-founder of MQTT. Uh, has been working with us, uh, Lance and myself, a pretty good bit on some of the internal development that we're doing. And also joining me is Lance Doffelmeyer. Uh, he's our chief data scientist. Uh, so we've created a, a new division within, within MR to really focus on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And it really plays into a lot with what Arlen has created with MQTT. So really want to start off with Arlen and see if he could give us you know, some background and his history in the development of the MQTT protocol. Sure, thanks. Um, well, uh, <laughs> how I got started was I was uh, actually an electrical engineer uh, at Oklahoma State. Um, and when I graduated, it was uh, late 1970s, 1979, um, I was hired by Coke Oil. Uh, the Coke brothers had just uh, started their fractionation facility in a little town called Medford, Oklahoma. So I report for work and I said, you know, well, what am I supposed to do? And they said, well, uh, we've never had an actual engineer here. So why don't you just kind of like drive around and invent stuff? which was pretty wide open. Uh, but what happened is that uh, Coke were just putting in their pipeline systems from Medford, Oklahoma to deliver ethane to Mont Bellevue, Texas. So we had to put in a SCADA system. So I got to work and the nice thing about Coke is you could do, if you wanted to do it, they would let you do it. So everything from running the ditch witch, uh, putting conduit in the ground, uh, wiring up, 5,000 horse electric uh, Westinghouse motors, connecting those to the vacuum tube starters, connecting the whole system to a Modicon 484 PLC. And you have to realize uh, when I got to Coke, they were still using relay logic. They had these big relay panels. And the, the PLC late 70s was when the PLCs just started coming out. And also in conjunction with that, uh, you have to realize Modbus just came out. So 1979 uh, Mod is when Modicon released Modbus protocol. Uh, so over that eight years that I worked for Coke, I learned a lot about industrial communications. Uh, we were using four wire uh, multi-drop circuits from AT&T using 300 baud Bell 202 modems. And that was how we connected to our RTUs that were up and down the pipeline system. So after several years with Coke, I uh, was one of the co-founders of a company called Arcom Control Systems and took a lot of the paradigm knowledge I had learned working in SCADA systems. And we started designing uh, industrial network gateways because we had all of these 1970 protocols that nobody knew how they worked. And they wanted to convert those protocols to more modern ones like Modbus at the time. And over the course of years at Arcom, we made a very good business um, in creating these protocol converters. At one point in time, I believe we had 70 to 80% of all of the midstream pipeline companies in the United States were using our protocol converter products. Then in the late 1990s, a very disruptive thing happened in the, in the industry, if you will. And that was when AT&T got deregulated. Now realize up until that point, AT&T were your go, they were the go-to company if you wanted wide area lease phone lines. And after they got deregulated, that market collapsed very, very quickly as far as reliability. Reliability went down, costs went up. And that vacuum was filled by the VSAT manufacturers. So we had GE, SpaceNet, Galat, Scientific Atlanta, AT&T, Tridem, were all coming out on the market with your, your VSAT system that you could put at remote facilities like water, wastewater, oil and gas, and get connected. But the devil in the details there was that everybody did their own proprietary transport protocol to get from the remote location to the VSAT hub and then from the VSAT hub back into your SCADA system. So we were challenged at that point in that we had proprietary protocols in the field, proprietary transport protocols, 
and it just was got very complex. So the first thing that happened late 1990s, uh, Philips 66 got the first TCP/IP based VSAT. So their their VSAT system was actually using TCP/IP as the transport over the network. That was a great thing, but there's also the problem with, with VSAT is you have latency. So you've got hundreds of milliseconds latency going out and then hundreds of milliseconds in the response coming back. So pole response protocols like Allen Bradley or Modbus, things like that were very slow and they were very expensive. So uh, at the time, Steve Koenig was the SCADA manager for Philips 66 and he said, Arlen, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Uh, we're working with IBM on our IT side of our business, and they're using this thing called message-oriented middleware, uh, or we know it as enterprise service bus today. But he said what's unique is that when people write applications, they just publish their information. And then other people that are interested in that can subscribe to that information, and you don't need to know where it came from. And he said, well, what we're doing with these protocol converters in the field is very similar in that we're polling the native PLCs and RTUs, and then we're publishing that over the VSAT system. So why don't we actually take advantage of that? And so that was the genesis, if you will, of MQTT, is I got to work with the co-inventor, uh, Andy Stanford Clark, and he was from IBM. And we took, at the time, what was a huge uh, a messaging oriented middle system for IT and started looking how to we could change that to be lean and mean and efficient for a real time command and control SCADA system. And so it, it took us six, seven, eight months for the first prototype. And that was the first version of MQTT. And that's how it all got started. Yeah, could you maybe, you know, we we see a lot of other protocols that just similar to that, uh, close to MQTT, like a DMP3, whether it's you know uh, Ethernet or serial. Uh, could you cover the benefits? Because I I've messed with DMP3 and and especially with some of the Allen Bradley PLCs, and to me, there's a lot of disadvantages of the DMP3. Uh, and really, I, I really, was really looking into it from a standpoint of being able to, you know, discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages with customers. Could you maybe kind of cover the, the differences in the DMP3 and the MQTT? Well, I, I think from that standpoint, Robert, we took a huge advantage. I, I tell people, uh, Andy and I kind of cheated when we, we did MQTT. As you can imagine, there was a lot of pressure on us when we first started looking at how we were going to do this um, to use UDP. Because remember, late 1990s, TCP IP, I mean, come on, we still had RS-232 ports on our laptops, right? So TCP IP as a transport was very new, and it, they, the perception was it had a lot of overhead on it. Right. UDP is simple, man. You just put, you know, send a packet and it's going to get there. Or it's not. Well, as we started looking at that, Andy and I figured that for a reliable SCADA system where we we're going to send commands, and we were going to do report by exception, that we would probably reinvent TCP using UDP and we probably wouldn't do a very good job. So the huge advantage of MQTT is it sets right on top of TCP IP. So it lets TCP IP do all the heavy lifting. It lets it do the packet reassembly, the in-order delivery, the CRC checking, all of that GORPY stuff that you would have had to implement had you have done your own, you know, from scratch protocol, you know, everything, your own CRC checking, your own packet reassembly. So that's one of the huge advantages. And interestingly is that, you know, if, people read the MQTT spec. And I think that's one of the other huge advantages is that if you look at the original MQTT spec, it's 18 pages long, 18 pages. I mean, look at, look at the OPCUA spec. 
it's thousands of pages long. So what are your chances of implementing that protocol correctly the first time? It's pretty slim. Um, the other thing that it let us do was take advantage of security. So people read the MQTT spec, Robert, and they go, well, Arlen, we can't use it. It, it. There's no security. And what people have to understand is that since MQTT sets on top of TCP IP, that means that we will always get to take advantage of the latest TCP IP security protocols, whatever they may be. Of course, today that's TLS, but when we started in the you know, 80s, late 90s and early 2000s, that could have been you know, tunnel protocols or anything else that we were using. So that, that's to me uh, is one of the huge advantages of MQTT over other industrial protocols. I, I guess you, one you of the other, your head there, yeah, go uh, ahead. because you you're building it on top of TCP IP. And so there's already millions of people who are working with analyzing that, that protocol. Um, and so you have a lot more people that are, are looking at the security than you would if you would try to implement that yourself. Yeah, Lance, oh. maybe you, could you cover just a, you know, I, I know we're adopting that as a standard internally, maybe you could cover, you know, some of the reasons why MR Systems has chosen MQTT as a protocol uh, for implementing a, a few of our uh, products that we're doing. I mean, one of the, the biggest things that has stood out to us for MQTT is uh, probably the Storm 4 was what originally had led us to use the MQTT protocol. And that's so important because um, you know, we have a lot of remote facilities and devices out in the water and wastewater industry. And as Arlen was saying earlier, is that the MQTT protocol was really built from and around remote sites. And so it kind of has this heritage of remote sites. And so they've already thought about um, what happens if we lose communication. And, and part of that is the storm forward capability. So if a, if a remote site uh, loses communications, it will backfill that data locally. And then not only will it publish that data upon establish uh, reconnecting that, that uh, connection, it will do it in the order at which the data was generated. And so it's very important for time series data. And that ties into uh, not missing alarms, that ties into, uh, you know, we're running ML models and we need the, the order of data is very important for us and how we interpret that data. Um, and so the storm forward was, was really important for us. The other major advantage that we see is the, the truth from the edge. And so as, as Arlen will get into in a little bit, uh, we're able to establish what data is at the edge and it's published all the way up. And so we're not trying to decide at the you know, enterprise layer what this data is, it's decided at the edge. Um, you know, in some of our applications, we've counted the, the data will take upwards to 50 hops. Um, and so, you know, every hop you have the, the struggle or the, you know, risk of data being manipulated in some way, but because it's, it's generated and decided at the edge, we don't really have as much concerns because we know it's going to be consistent all the way up. Yep. Arla, maybe you can kind of cover a little bit of, uh, why is MQTT uh, more efficient? And I know uh, this, the security aspect compared to some of the other, the OPC UA, I know that they've added the, the security to that. Uh, we internally, we looked at that initially as a potential, of, uh, but we quickly decided not to use that in place of the MQTT. Uh, and then maybe also kind of going into kind of piggybacking on what Lance was saying, how it can actually reduce development time. Okay. Well, again, I, the, the single source of truth is so, is so critical in a lot of these systems that we're doing. Um, but let me go back to the beginning. Because MQTT, one of the advantages of MQTT is it has state. And that again, we're taking advantage of TCP IP, we're taking advantage of IT technology. So when an MQTT session is established from a remote site, a remote uh, lift station, uh, anything in water, wastewater, 
that establishes an outbound uh, secure MQ, uh, TCP IP socket connection. Well, now we're using TCP IP and we know that that socket is open and we can publish data anytime we want. Now, if you think about it, that's huge because our mentality in industrial controls is we're gonna pull and we're gonna get a response. We're gonna process that data. Now we don't know what it is, so we're gonna pull again. And we're gonna process that data and it's constant pull response. MQTT, what it does with, along with the spark plug specification establishes that connection, publishes all of your process variables from your PLCs or your RTUs in the field, and then it doesn't have to publish those again until they change. So you can think of all of the Booleans that you're polling, valve statuses, you know, tank alarm statuses, where they may only change once a day or not even that. Uh, pressures, temperatures, flow rates can be dead banded so that Typically, over the last 22 years that we've replaced poll response with MQTT, we see an 80 to 95% reduction in bandwidth for the same data at the same update rate. Now, and if, I take that, <laughs> if I take that in, and that was cost savings, right? But that also gives you the leeway of getting some of that data that's being stranded today if you're going to gain efficiencies in your existing uh, radio network, maybe that, maybe that would give you the ability then to go get other measurements that you're leaving stranded in the field right now. And I think that's one of the things we talk with our customers all the time is that we're probably leaving 80 to 90 percent of valuable information that we could be using. We're leaving it stranded in the field because we didn't have the bandwidth to go get it. That also ties into, you know, the amount that we store, and that's becoming ever more important in this day of, you know, data science and, and machine learning that report by exception, because I don't want to record the same value over and over again in the historian. Just tell me when it changed so I can put a timestamp on it and move on. Yeah, and, and a lot of, you know, traditionally, a lot of our RTUs were uh, radio, uh, move into cellular. So we are trying to limit the use of, you know, the bandwidth. So that, that has been a, a huge uh, advantage for us to look into the MQTT and be able to monitor uh, the traffic and, and keep the cost down as much as possible. Like I was, uh, my son's actually going through some of the ignition training and stuff. And he was asking me, and I was talking with him about the MQTT stuff. And I said, well, you know, say you're, you're sitting here controlling a bunch of different things, you know, up to a thousand things. And once a second, I'm going to ask you, what's the status of all thousand? And every second, I'm just going to keep asking you. But what if nothing changes? You know, wouldn't you rather just say, hey, I'll let you know if something changes? And I think he, he grasped that pretty quick. Like, yeah, that's, that is a, a much better way of thinking about it. Why would you just sit here and keep hammering me nonstop? You know, that's just making me do things that I, and for you to have to sit there and process it, that's just dumb. So, uh, that is, yeah, and, and people, and uh, Robert, a lot of people have trouble wrapping their head around report by exception. Well, well, what if we miss it? But that that's, again, going back, we're leveraging IT technology. I mean, uh, as as uh, Lance was saying, that we, we have, hundreds of thousands of engineers working with TCP IP every day. So we're pretty confident that once we establish that socket connection and we're publishing MQTT messages, that's why MQTT has state built into it where if we fall off the network in real time, all of your systems that are subscribing to information coming from that remote site will receive what's called a death certificate. In other words, I died. I fell off the network. And that's when we kick in at the remote site. All of those tags that we are measurements that we were publishing go into a store and forward queue with their timestamp in milliseconds. All of the applications on the enterprise side are notified that, hey, that site is currently down. But then when it comes back up over cellular or VSAT or whatever, it's going to establish that connection. 
And then it's going to publish a birth certificate that says, hey, I'm back online. And then it's going to take those queued measurements, those process variables, publish those in order. And now you're back and your system is back up and running. And, you know, having the ability to define the process variable at the, at the source. In other words, you know, we, we are so uh, uh, ingrained in key value pair from registers, right? We have a Modbus register. We have an Allen Bradley register. We get it on the screen. And what's the first thing we do? We have to double click on it and give it context. Is it scaled? What's its engineering units? Um, you know, what's its engineering ranges? And then if we use that Modbus register again, we've got to do that again and again and again. It becomes a constant care and feeding of these measurements that the enterprise want to use. Well, if I can take that all the way back to the edge, define it, give it a name, give it engineering units, scale it. So when I publish it, that is that single source of truth that then everybody that's subscribed to that within your whole infrastructure now knows what you've done. You, it knows your capability. It knows that this is a water level. This is a pressure. This is a flow rate. Yeah, that's so important and, for us because we're, we're really starting to see a unification of all these facilities. Um, it's no longer, oh, we've got a site over here and they operate as a silo and they do their own thing. All these sites are being connected these days. And we're really seeing this enterprise level analysis um, and you know, looking at this data from a central location. And so if I can publish data uh, from a single source of truth from the edge, I can bring in you know, a few sites or even hundreds of sites and I don't have to shift through and make sense of this data. I already know that this is a level from this location. Um, it's because it's published from the edge. It's a huge advantage when we're building these enterprise systems. Why do you think it's taken so long? Or, I mean, this you were working on this back in 1995. And now I, I think for some people, at least our customers probably think, you know, this is something new. And I think your original intent, you know, from talking with you uh, when I first met you and everything that, you know, you really saw that this was going to be something that could benefit the water and wastewater industry, especially for the RTUs and the application that we're using it now. But it seemed like it got a quicker adoption uh, in some other areas. And then, like you were saying, if you could elaborate on, you know, some of the other ind industries that are really taking advantage of this right now. Well, yeah, you're right. You're right. It is interesting. Now, realize... Um, and I did a good thing. I mean, we we actually developed the first MQTT prototype. It took us about six, eight months, if I remember correctly. But it took us over a year to have IBM op open source the spec. Because you can, again, the late 90s, IBM wasn't in the big op open source uh, uh, mentality at that time. So it was open when we first published the spec. But the only MQTT broker implementations were from IBM and they were very expensive. So I would say for the first probably 10 to 12 years, uh, MQTT was very sequestered underneath the, the machine uh, at IBM. But then it started escaping. Um, Andy and I worked very hard to get it through the standards body. So that was that was the first thing is we got it through the OASIS standards body. Now it's an what international was, standard. When was that? Like at what stage did you realize? That was probably about nine years ago, nine or 10 years ago. So then people started hearing about it. Then we started a project in the Eclipse Software Foundation. That project is called Pahu. And all of the code that I wrote at ARCOM, that my engineers wrote, the IBM engineers, that was all put into the Eclipse PAHO project. So now people could get their hands on MQTT code. Well, then the IT guys came along and probably the first big um, blog post, if you will, was Facebook published a blog and said when they first did Facebook Messenger, it didn't work. It, it ate their the battery up off the phone. It was slow. It took, you know, 
uh, multiple seconds, if not minutes, to get a Facebook message delivered. And they found the spec out on the internet and they saw the PAHO code and they wrote a blog post on how in just a few months, they were able to use MQTT for Facebook Messenger and they still use it today. Uh, so that kind of gave the kind of visibility, if you will, of MQTT. Hey, what is this? and Where did it come from? Then, you know, and, and I, that's kind of ironic, right? We, we designed it for industrial control systems and then the social network kind of hijacks it. But if you look out in industry today, look at Microsoft Azure IoT, look at AWS IoT Core, look at Google Cloud Platform, look at IBM Watson IoT, they're all using MQTT technology. So I think what's happened is it's simple, keep it simple, stupid, right? It's on the wire, simple protocol. Now there's a large community that know about it. So we're leveraging, you know, tens of that, hundreds of thousands of people that use these cloud services. So we're getting visibility that way. And then you know, use it, working with inductive automation and doing the MQTT modules, we showed how we can apply it in the industrial sector. And then finally, we took the, that definition, the single source of truth that Lance was talking about, and we, we put in a spec. And that spec is called spark plug. And that spark plug spec, we donated or we gave it to the Eclipse Foundation, much like we did with PAHO originally. And now the spark plug spec lives in the Eclipse Software Foundation. Now, what, what spark plug does, if, if you think about this, remember we were talking about MQTT as a message transport. And, and the reason Facebook uses it, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, IBM, SAP, is you can do anything you want and you can publish anything you want on any topic. Andy and I did not specify a payload format. We didn't specify a topic namespace. But if you're trying to be in an ecosystem where you can interoperate, the bad thing is you can publish anything you want on any topic. So four years ago, we're looking out at the industry. We see all of these people talking about MQTT. We see all the cloud providers talking about it that everybody does it different. So the spark plug spec, all it does is a, is a simple specification that says, hey, if you wanna use MQTT in a mission critical real-time control system, this is probably a good place to start. Let's use this topic namespace so we can do auto discovery. Let's, let's do a, let's specify the way that you publish a process variable object so that when Lance gets that object, he knows the name, where it came from, what the engineering units are, what the data type is. He knows all that information because that is defined in the Spark Plug specification. Yeah, that's that's really streamlined our development because uh, we'll spend, you know, typically when we're doing these enterprise solutions, we'll spend a majority of the time, you know, if we're not using MQTT. We'll spend the majority of the time defining, redefining the data like you were talking about earlier. But with Sparkplug, now we've seen a shift to where we spend most of our time defining it once at the edge. Then we subscribe to that data and it's the exact same data at the enterprise level. There's no rework at the enterprise level. Yeah, maybe Lance, uh, you know, I think a lot of this, uh, if you could cover kind of from the setup, not only just new additions to a network, but essentially from scratch, you know, you've, you've worked with Arlen on this and you've set up our, our, even our cloud infrastructure to be able to use MQTT. And really from scratch right now, uh, all this stuff that we're talking about, uh, it's essentially handles that automatically. I mean, there's not a lot of configuration uh, may sound complicated, but really, could you go through some of the setup that you've worked with Arlen just from an application, you know, for, from an MR applications engineer, uh, kind of that process? Yeah, I mean, for us, we really wanted to bring together a large amount of, of data sources. Um, you know, we're fortunate that we work with 
a lot of boots on the ground in MR. And so we're we're out in the field, we're looking at this these these sensors. Um and you know, we we started looking at these these cloud applications and we noticed that uh, it's only as good as the data that is being provided to them. And so I, I feel like that's one advantage that MR has is that we're out in the field, we're looking at these sensors, we're calibrating these sensors, we're making sure that the scaling is right in the PLC. And so the next logical step for us was, well, how do we get this data out and make sure that it's still good? And it was the MQTD was, is, is the perfect answer for that. Um, and so we'll go in and we'll define um, a spark plug a topic for a client. And it's usually for a, a client name and then we'll break apart um, their facilities as, as separate subtopics. And so once we bring all that data in, we've defined it at the edge, we'll start subscribing those clients. And so by the time it gets to the enterprise layer, uh, the hard work, the grunt work is already done. Um, and we know that that data is good. Yeah, so I mean, like the other day you worked uh, with one of our uh, engineers and he went on site and probably within a couple hours, he got the module installed and was basically able to push, push data out uh, yeah, so and we can and we can publish thousands of tags almost instantaneously once we subscribe to that topic, which is pretty cool to see. And Arlen, I know you showed this to us as well. Uh, it's pretty amazing to see how quick these tags populate. I mean, it's really just refresh and boom, you've got 10,000 tags. Yeah, and, the, and with the work that we've done with um, Amazon, uh, so we did, we have been doing a lot of work with Amazon and their uh, industrial IoT team. And the site-wise development that we did was, was, was really driven by that very fact, is that what we were seeing is, as you can imagine, working with inductive automation, we had all these projects where people were trying to take all of these measurements, these process variables, and throw them up into the data lake. You know, so the sea level came down and said, hey, we're digital transformation. We're going we're gonna to get all of our information in the cloud. Well, what we were seeing was that wasn't fixing the problem. It was just moving the problem down the road. Because, you know, having a million pressures in a data lake isn't helping me. So then we saw the, the system, the consultants on the backside of the data lake trying to stitch the data back together in probably the form that you knew it was already in the PLC. So that's when I think Microsoft and, and, and Amazon both have realized they needed another service. And for Amazon, that service is called SiteWise. And SiteWise lets you build a model first. It doesn't, it, it doesn't say, oh, give me a bunch of tags and I'll go write a bunch of code and Python code and JavaScript. No, it says, okay, we're gonna define a pump station. And then once we've got that pump station model, we're going to instantiate it and that's going to create an asset. And then that asset has measurements. Well, if we look at that on the edge, that single source of truth, now we can take Ignition, build a UDT, which is a user data type, which is basically a model. We instantiate that model that creates an asset out on the edge. And then we give that asset the measurements. Well, the cool thing now is that we, when we publish that model, that goes all the way up to Amazon, creates the model if it's not already there in SiteWise, then creates the asset, then populates the asset. So now when a customer goes in, he doesn't get a data lake with a kabillion tags. He gets a you know, pump station and it, it, this is the, the location of it. And here's all of your assets you've got there. Here's your tank. Here's your pump. Here's your valve. And then all of the measurements under that. Here's your valve state. Here's your tank level. Here's your pump status. And the biggest, the biggest value of that is that we're not spending time reinventing that model. Now we're spending our time actually trying to make sense of the data and pull insights out of the data. It's a complete, complete shift in, in resources and time. Arlen, why do you think, uh, you know, I've, I've been kind of frustrated with some of the, the leading PLC manufacturers, you know, the Allen Bradley, the Modicon of, why are they not adapting this? Uh, is it just 
they're entrenched in their old protocols because uh, it, it just it seems like this is such a, a pro, you know there's a protocol that takes advantage of so many things that are perfect for the controls industry across the board uh, have you been approached by some of them and they're just they're they're on the verge of doing this could you elaborate a little bit uh, sure. Uh, you know, uh, in a perfect world, you know, MQTT spark plug uh, will, will come out tomorrow and everybody's life will be great. Uh, that's not going to happen. We know we live in a brownfield world and we are for the next decade. Uh, but we are making that shift. So that is one of the reasons to your very point. That's one of the reasons Chevron was part of the spark plug working group was one of the founding members is they wanted to go to their suppliers and say, hey, we want you to implement MQTT, and there's this spec that's, that is formalized now within the Eclipse Foundation so that people can go consume that. Now, having said that, there are a lot of early adopters, I think, that are going to be driving it, and the, you know, the, the entrenched players will come around. So behind me, the, the, the flashy thing behind me, that's Opto22's Epic. So the, the Epic and the, the Groove Rio both implement MQTT spark plug natively. Um, I've got a, just an example of another edge device. This is a multi-tech conduit 300. It does LoRaWAN on top of being able to run ignition edge. So that's huge. That means I could interface LoRaWAN sensors to it. I've got another device. This is a signal fire ranger. And this is a, a battery power uh, for up to, I think, four years, four to 20 milliamp input, digital input, digital output. It'll talk Modbus locally. And again, it, they've implemented spark plug natively in this device as well. So we are getting there and we're seeing more every day now. We're hearing about uh, another PLC or another automation device that is implementing spark plug B. So I think we've gained that, that, that synergy we need, and now it's happening very rapidly in the market. Yeah, well, I was telling you uh, the other day that uh, Bedrock PLC is now adopting the spark plug MQTT. And this really was within a very short time frame that they've done this. And already, I've really been approached by two customers that are willing to, to move away from their current PLCs to Alan Bradley. So I think an Alan Bradley or Modicon, they really need to jump on board because they could start losing some market share to this just <laughs> based on the support of that protocol. Uh, you know, the, the one came out the other day with the Modbus uh, denial of service, and there's really not a patch for that. You know, there's a lot of vulnerabilities in a lot of these other industrial protocols. And, you know, to your point, the security, and the lightweight, to me, it just, you know, makes logical sense to move to that. Um, are there any other emerging technologies or anything uh, on the horizon that you? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, it, 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 to me, I think we can leverage this for a long time. One way that I, I kind of uh, explain this is that the Internet of People, exploded, right? And the Internet of People exploded with two available open source technologies. One was a transport, HTTP, right? So we have hypertext transfer protocol, and it was out there, and people were using it for message boards and chats. And then somebody came along and said, well, wouldn't it, you know, HTTP is a good transport. What if we defined what was in it? And that's called HTML. And now we all know that as web browsers and web technology and web sockets, and it's exploded. We've been talking about the explosion of the Internet of Things, the industrial Internet of Things. And I think a lot of people are kind of in that trough of disillusionment because it, it hasn't happened as quickly as the pundit said it was going to happen, right? To your point, nothing is interoperable yet. But if we can get to the point where people realize is that 
MQTT has already become the de facto messaging standard. That's the HTTP of industrial. And if Sparkplug can leverage that, it's the definition, it's the HTML part of it, then I think you're going to see an explosion of innovation. And then people will be able, you know, it's the, I like it, the, the notion is you don't need to be given permission to innovate. You showed an interesting, and I can't remember, it's been a while now, but you had showed a, a chart of the comparison of the HTML or HTTP versus MQTT on the internet. What were yeah. those statistics? It was that MQTT is the most white, even over HTTP, right? Well, that was that, that, yeah, I know what chart you were talking about. That is what, what IP technology are you using in industrial? So the, the survey was industrial, you're right. And, you know, people were originally, uh, whether it was a Raspberry Pi or whatever, originally they were doing HTTP messaging. But when people started figuring out MQTT as Raspberry Pi started shipping node red automatically on the Raspberry Pi, you know, I go to universities now and if you ask an engineering class, how many of you students, girls or boys have a Raspberry Pi in your dorm room? Just about every hand goes up. Um, so, you know, I think that is where, so if my outlook is that I think we have everything we need, everything's coming together so that we can standardize on a transport technology, on a representation, and then we all get to innovate and we don't have to spend 90% of our project time just trying to get a measurement from point A to point B. And understand what that measurement is. It's already defined. <laughs> right. Can you, uh, what else, Steve? yeah, I was going to say, Arlen, can you talk a little bit about how you've seen MQTT aid in data science and, and machine learning? Well, if you look at, I mean, you know, it, I, and I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, a machine learning or, or predictive analysis expert, but I do know, I mean, even if you look at the tools that you've got, like on Amazon with SageMaker, uh, things like that, and you've got to basically put the components together and they're called lambdas uh, on Microsoft, they're called C functions. Uh, but it, what, if, it, what's interesting, if you look under the covers of lambdas and C functions, how are they communicating? They're using MQTT, right? So IT have already figured out that a message-oriented middleware is the way to go. In other words, I just subscribe to information. I don't care where it came from. Now, having said that, IBM, Microsoft, Azure, all the folks, or uh, AWS, they, they have their own MQTT namespace and, and, and payload definition as well. But I think we're all getting to the realization and we're trying in the Sparkplug working group to reach out to those people as well. Um, and hopefully we'll get to a point where we all are using a really efficient messaging infrastructure and we've got the payload definition and the topic namespace to where then we can really innovate. And, and I think that's going to be in data science, that's going to be the next holy grail is that this is the internet of things, right? I've got all these things back here and you gotta know what they are. You got, what is a four to 20 milliamp loop? Why is that important to know? What is a limit switch and a valve? Why is that important to know? So we've got this tribal knowledge out in, in the operational world and we're trying to get that tribal knowledge up to IT so they can use it. Um, one of my favorites is, let's take a flow computer. It could be it, you know, water or oil and gas. And if I look at a flow computer and you look at all the configuration and all the enumerations, uh, one of my favorites is the, the orifice material on an orifice plate. What, what is it? Oh, it's enumeration, it's zero, one, two, three, four. So here you are, you're a data scientist, you're up there and you've got, well, this enumeration, you've got this enumeration, you've got this enumeration, and you have no idea what that is. Again, 
to your point with spark plug, not only can you do like the engineering units and things like that, you've got the ability to take those enumerations out of the source and change those into something that's humanly readable. So again, I say our jobs as SCADA engineers are to take this tribal knowledge, this operational knowledge and make it consumable by a human being that isn't an expert in that particular process. And that building of the data streams that is easy to understand, almost a, a friendly name has been critical for us because what we've seen is in, in more traditional methods of, of getting data, we were spending a large amount of time cleaning that data, transforming that data, relabeling that data. I don't have to do that. With MQTT, it's already labeled. I can go directly maybe with some minor cleaning into building models and doing predictive analytics. And that's been a huge time saver for us as well. Yeah, I think ultimately, uh, you know, our path down this, Lance's initial uh, drive was the machine learning part. And then the MQTT was kind of for us a stepping stone to, to ultimately get him to what he's capable of doing. So kind of starting out, it was taking 10 years worth of data off, you know, some on-site historian to kind of prove some of the machine learning. And then once he was able to, to be able to predict and improve processes and do things like that, it was like, uh, how, do we, how are we going to be able to get this data and be able to do it real time and then be able to centralize this? So that, then that was really where we, you know, engaged uh, Arlen in this. You know, I, I know Lance has... He's wanting to take it, you know, much further and even, you know, being able to sit at home and just say, hey, Alexa, you know, what's, what's the total flow? What can I expect for tomorrow? You know, what's the effluent flow predicted to be tomorrow? And really leverage some of that uh, machine learning stuff to improve uh, the process, whether it's water, wastewater. Uh, you want to elaborate on any of that, Lance? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've done some successful pilots with Alexa, and that's been really cool uh, to just start to have a, a normal conversation with your SCADA system. And we, we see MQT as, as being the backbone of, of getting that live data stream. And you're right, when we first started this, it was, you know, proof of concept with these historical databases, but it, it moves very, very quickly to uh, real-time data feeds, because that's how we're used to consuming data in this modern world. Um, I think another area that MQTT leverages is bi-directional. So I'm not just consuming the data and making sense of it in real time. I'm also able to uh, interact. And you know, if I train a model, I'm able to um, provide recommendations to operations or even uh, influence processes in real time. Yeah, and to Arlen's point on the, the benefits, you know, like we're currently working on a, uh, a customer site that has, you know, say th around 300 lift stations that are common. So once we create that one single UDT, we just stamp it out for the rest of them. So, and there are some additional things that we're pushing up, you know, GPS locations to be able to, so that makes it really easy to, to efficiently be able to push up, you know, additional information in those packages uh, so that we can do them on maps and things like that, showing the, the actual locations. Yeah, that was pretty cool. We we developed a a single definition of a, a pump station like you were talking about earlier, Arlen. And we wrote a simple Python script to uh, create all the connections to the, the PLCs. And it was, you know, a matter of minutes uh, that we had several hundred facilities that were posting data. And that was uh, it was pretty cool to see. Well, Arlen, I appreciate you coming on and Kind of going through all this is, I actually love hearing the history of it every time you know, <laughs> I've been a part. We certainly appreciate it, Arlen. It's always a joy to talk, uh, always an inspiration, and uh, we're very thankful to be able to partner with you and your team, and and uh, it certainly helped our, our application. Well, and I, I, I really appreciate you guys jumping on early on the AWS stuff, and, you know, let's prove it out, and, and let's, uh, you know, I'd love to get Am Amazon is still in this, um, they want to use OPC UA, they don't want to use MQTT because somebody at corporate said that. 
but I think um, what we're seeing is more and more people are just rolling out using Spark Plug uh, Bridge. Um, and I just want to make that, I mean, again, for the water industry, that that was 20% of our business last year. I'd like to make it 80% of our business because I think it's so applicable to the water market. It's incredible. 